Good morning, everybody. It's Becky Suomalo with New Hampshire Audubon and our live Facebook Q&A. So if you've got questions, go ahead and send them in. Uh, send a, a message or comment to this uh, live video and I'll see if I can answer the questions for you. Uh, it's great to be here. I've got a couple of questions from last time that we were together uh, that I'll answer in a few minutes. Uh, but the first thing that I want to do is talk about a question that is coming up quite a bit now, and that is, when should I take down my hummingbird feeders? So hummingbirds are here in the summertime, and they migrate south in the fall. Um, they start their migration at the end of July or early August, for some of them anyway, particularly the uh, adult males. Um, but then the females and younger hummingbirds will continue that migration or they'll be starting their migration uh, in August and they continue into early September. And then sometimes there'll be some late stragglers that hang around and are late migrating. So um, if you can leave your feeder up, that would be really helpful for those late straggling migra migration birds, those, those last ones that are late to migrate, they'll be looking for food, they'll be really happy to find your feeder. Um, the hummingbirds are triggered to migrate by the changing day length, so you don't have to worry that putting your feeder out will cause them to stay here longer. Um, they'll, they'll still migrate, they'll just get a boost from the food in your feeder. Um, there are still some plants around. We may have a frost coming up, so that may reduce some of them. But um, the, the additional feeder source will be really helpful. And as usual, um, just make sure that your feeders are clean and that you change the nectar frequently, particularly when it gets warm. Um, the, the nectar can go bad in the war on the warm days, so just make sure you change it frequently and uh, that it's still good. So I would leave them up until, oh, let's see, hummingbirds should be gone by mid-October. If they're not, they're going to really be struggling. But if you want to leave it up through October, that's fine. Um, it won't be a problem, but certainly through September, there are plenty of birds around. All right, so I'm going to check my uh, phone where I'm hopefully um, going to be able to see any comments that you are questions that you all have left and of course i'm having trouble with it as i usually do if you've seen me before you know technology is not my forte so let's see what i can do to find find the live video oh i can't find it so hopefully everything is going okay um and you're able to see and hear me um i'll take a moment in a sec and uh play with my phone one more time see. Okay, pardon me for just a second while I check and find out. They've moved some things around on Facebook and oh boy, now I've really done it. Okay, uh, Facebook. All right. Hold on here. Um, videos. All right. Well, I've done something. So we'll keep going with a couple of questions that I still need to answer, and then I'll check back in and see if I can find find you all on my phone here. What has happened with that? All right. If it isn't one thing, it's another. Okay, so a couple of questions that came up last time um, when we were doing a Facebook Live here were questions about green darner migration. Green darner is a dragonfly. It's a big dragonfly. It's green and uh, got some green and bluish color on it. And they migrate much the way monarchs migrate. And I had read something about it, but I'd forgotten what I read. So I looked it up and there was a study that was published um, in uh, late 2018, early 2019, uh, that showed some fascinating results for um, the green darner migration. And what they did was they took samples from thousands of green darners. Um, they took it from their wings and used hydrogen isotopes to figure out where the dragonflies had been born. 
So then they could compare that with where they were caught and see how far they traveled as adults. And then they used citizen science data to determine sort of when they emerge and migrate. And what they found was amazing. So in February and March, generation emerges in the southern US, Mexico, and the Caribbean, and they travel north. So when the temperature is 48 degrees or higher, that triggers their um, emergence and migration. And they go as far as the northeast or the upper Midwest and get there by May. And then when they're up here in May, they lay their eggs and they die. Now, the migration distance that they may do, on average, it's about 373 miles, but some go as far as 1,553 miles. Um, so they can travel a long ways. Um, so they lay eggs, they die. Then that next generation, when it comes out, some overwinter as nymphs where they are up in the northern part and some mature and head back south between July and October. So we could see them now heading south. And then the generation that goes south, they lay eggs down south. Those that hatch are non-migratory over the winter. So this whole generation that's non-migratory in the winter time. And then that non-migratory generation lays eggs and those that come out nymphs hatch then they are the ones that migrate north in the spring so it's actually really fascinating um, so watch for them they tend not to migrate in big groups they'll be single they're um, just sort of sneaking by and you may not uh, sort of recognize that they're actually migrating dragonflies that was one of the comments that people made, that even people who research them seldom see flights of these dragonflies. Uh, all right, so the other uh, question that came up was about migrating hawks. And so it is uh, hawk migration time, and we're seeing lots of raptors coming through. Uh, Pac Mananoc had a day of over 900 broadwing hawks. Uh, last week. And so it is broadwing hawk migration. Uh, they tend to have a few really sort of peak flight days right around this time. So a second, third week in uh, September, maybe into the 25th, 26th of September is when you may see sort of really um, big flights of broadwings on the, the uh, good days for flight. But what I uh, wanted to look up and said I would check on was the farthest south that some of these migrating hawks that we see, the farthest south that they go. So I did a little bit of research and we'll start with the broadwing hawk. So broadwings are totally migratory. They don't stay here during the winter at all. They winter in Mexico um, to central South America. So quite a ways far, farther south. There are a few that winter in Southern Florida and then there's another race that's year round in the Caribbean. But most of our the birds that we see are gonna to go to Mexico or even farther south, all the way down to the central part of South America. Sharp-shinned hawks, which are one of our excipiters, they have the rounded wings and the long tail. Um, some of them stay around, some of them leave, but they tend to leave the northern part of their range, which would be us. They may go as far as 1500 miles in migration. Uh, their they winter, um, well, they're year round all the way down to mid South America. So sort of determining where our particular migrants go would be a little bit more difficult, um, but likely they're going down to parts of Central America. The Cooper's hawk, which is um, very, very similar to the sharp shinned hawk, a lot of them also winter in this area, but some do migrate to the southern U.S. and Mexico. Uh, they're really hard to tell apart um, from the sharp shinned hawks. They tend to be a little bit bigger, but there's overlap in size. They have a rounded tail, but sometimes that's hard to tell when their tails are kind of um, worn out. Um, but um, they're 
They've got the youngsters. The youngsters of Broadwing, Sharpton, and Coopers all look very similar because they've got a white breast with brown streaks and a brown back. Uh, so can be a challenge. Um, one of our common um, hawks that we see year round is red-tailed hawk, um, but some of them also migrate. Some of them stay right on territory, some of them migrate, but the farthest south that they go is Central America, maybe a few to Northern South America. Um, and then we have the osprey. Now that's a um, large raptor that feeds primarily on fish. 90 plus percent of their diet is fish. Uh, and they are totally migratory also, like the broad-winged hawk. They leave and they're not here in the winter time. And they winter in the northern half of South America. So they're going all the way down to South America um, for the winter time. They're generally found on latitudes near the equator in the winter. So that's that's their their wintering range. And then come spring, they'll return back to us. And then a couple of others that are interesting, we have our falcons, and that's the kestrel, the merlins, and the peregrines. And the kestrels are by and large migratory. Every once in a while we see one in the wintertime, um, but they they are such a wide-ranging species they're found all the way from Alaska to the southern tip of South America. Um, and some winter in southern Florida, but they could be anywhere south in that range. Merlins um, move generally to the south central U.S. and northern Mexico, but they can go all the way down to the northern tip of South America. And then the peregrine falcons um, are, are kind of interesting. They winter all the way down to southern South America and the northernmost tundra breeders, they move the farthest to Central America, Central Argentina and Chile. So you have these northernmost breeding peregrines going all the way down to the southernmost part of their range. It's really interesting. Okay, let me take a minute and see if I can find you all on Facebook um, and uh, see check and see what these comments are. Videos. Uh, all right, live. All right, hey, I think I got gotcha. you. All right, hi, Stefan, there's a question here. What part of the day do barred owls become active? Great question. And um, barred owls are normally active in the evening, in the dark actually. Um, you'll hear them start to hoot um, when it's when it's sort of breeding season, they can get going um, just as it's getting dark, um, but they'll be active all night long. Now that being said, in the winter time, sometimes when we've got heavy snow cover uh, and they're working hard to um, to find food, then they'll be active during the daytime as well. They feed primarily on small rodents. And those small rodents are usually active at night, but when we have a heavy snow cover, they may be active under the snow. That's kind of a protective layer for the, these small rodents. And the um, barred owls will oftentimes sit by feeders. They might try for a bird um, incidentally, but for the most part, they're looking for the small mice and voles that are feeding on the seed that's fallen under your feeder. And they may sit there during the day looking for some activity um, if they're getting hungry and having a hard time finding food. But for the most part, when I've um, heard, well, when I've seen barred owls during the daytime, it's, I've usually been alerted to them by chickadees or other birds that are calling it, they found them and they're scolding them. Um, and you hear this little commotion of other birds in the woods, and then you can find the the owl. Um, but when I hear them at night, it is seldom before dark. It's usually after it is quite, um, you know, sort of solid dark, not even twilight. Whereas the, um, the great horned owl often calls sort of right at dusk. Just It's after sunset, but there's still some light in the sky. Or at sunrise, just as it's getting light, but before sunrise, you'll often hear them calling. But most of the other owls 
are going to wait until it's totally dark. All right. Again, it's Becky with New Hampshire Audubon. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to put a comment um, on the Facebook broadcast. It looks like I can see them. Oh, let me uh, let me show all comments here. Okay. There we go. I think I've got you all, hopefully. Um, if you have a chance to send me a quick comment, let me know everything's going okay. That would be great, especially now that I can see them. Um, and if you are watching this later, it's been recorded, and you have a question that you want to send in, you can email it to, um, <coughs> excuse me, to birds, etc. at nhaudubon.org. That's B-I-R-D-S-E-T-C at nhaudubon.org. And um, um, we'll, we have volunteer naturalists that will work to help answer your question and they call on us if they have additional questions. So don't hesitate to post a comment. Don't hesitate to send us an email. Uh, we're happy to answer questions. Okay, hi Stefan, let's see. Who's not available? I'm just checking my phone here because I can't see comments on my computer. Um, oh, I see a few comments. Ah, hi Cynthia. Hmm, how come you're not on my phone? Well, Cynthia, I see blue jays are what I hear alerting to barred owls. Absolutely, blue jays will squawk like crazy when they find an owl, as will crows. And people who are familiar with crow calls can recognize the calls that mean owl. They seem to have a special call that other crows recognize that says, I found an owl, I found an owl. And they'll be there and they'll squawk and pester that owl and try to get it to move along. Uh, and they can create quite a ruckus and bring in um, um, crows from other areas as well and bring in other birds like blue jays. But yes, blue jays will definitely squawk around an owl. And hi, Susan, lots of people do like owls. They love owls. They're very, very popular. Oh, all right. Um, oh, finally, I think I got everything working at last. All right, again, if you have any questions, send a comment. Look like I'm getting everything coming at last. Takes me a little bit. Um, and I mentioned, um, Hawk migration, don't forget to look up and watch for them. Today may be a good day. Uh, we talked about this before, but they take these thermals and rise up on the thermals, and that helps them. Then they get to the top of the thermal, and they glide down to the next one. And they spot those thermals by seeing debris that's been caught up in the rising air. That's actually pretty fascinating. Um, all right, a couple of other things that I wanted to, to mention. Um, somebody asked about what to do when you have a bird that hits your window. And so I want to chat about that for just a second. Oftentimes birds see the reflection in the window of the trees or the sky and they think they're flying into the, the woods or the sky and they bonk into the window and they fall down below the window. And oftentimes they will recover. So what you can do that's most helpful is to put them in a box that you can cover over either with the top of the box or put a towel over it. So it's warm and it's dark and just give them a chance to recuperate. And um, if it's really cold in winter, you might wanna bring it inside. You don't want them to get too hot, um, but you want them to be out of the, the the real cold. Um, right now it's just, you know, fine weather, just keep them dark, warm, and then wait a little while. And mm, sometimes maybe check them after half an hour. And what I usually do um, is I put them in the box, use a pretty good size box. You don't want to be, them to be cramped or anything. And sometimes I'll put a towel in the bottom so they have something for their feet to grab onto. But then I'll take that box outside and open it up. And oftentimes the bird has recovered enough that it will just fly off. 
Um, sometimes it looks alert, but it's not ready to go. And I'll hold it a little bit longer for maybe another half an hour. If it hasn't recovered after that time, or it's recovered but it doesn't appear to fly or doesn't appear to be doing well, then it needs to go to a wildlife rehabilitator that's licensed to care for injured and orphaned wildlife. And New Hampshire Fish and Game has um, a list on their website uh, of a wildlife rehabilitators in New Hampshire, and you can look for somebody that is close to you. Uh, but give them a chance to recover first because oftentimes they do, oftentimes they're just stunned. Uh, and then if you can, um, it's really helpful to put something on your window where the bird is hit so that it breaks up that reflection. And there are a number of different things that you can do. Silhouettes sometimes work, sometimes they don't. They've worked for me on some windows, but not on other windows. There are also um, very thin um, line treatments that you can put. A screen will work. Uh, we've got some examples at New Hampshire Audubon of things that you can do um, at the window, at your windows that will help break up that reflection so the birds don't bang, bang into them. But there are also starting to be some manufacturers that are producing um, glass that is bird safe. Uh, so if you're doing any renovations at all, um, definitely ask about that glass. It's really helpful. All right, don't hesitate. Send along a question or comment. Hi, folks. Let me know that you're out there. That'd be great. Um, and uh, if you have any questions or have anything on your mind, please, please let me know. Um, okay. I also didn't have a chance last time to talk about pelagic birds. And I wanted to mention them because they're really interesting birds, but also this is a time of year when it's good to look for them. And uh, we mentioned a little while ago, we had a hurricane came through that came inland. Now, the remnants were not a hurricane by the time they got to us, it came inland. But sometimes if we have coastal storms, it'll push towards the shore birds that are, um, are seagoing birds. So they, these are birds, they're called pelagic birds, and they spend most of their life at sea. And they're well adapted to flying sort of constantly over the water searching for food. And these are birds like Wilson's storm petrels. They're also leeches, storm petrels. And then there are shearwaters who are, they're named for their style of flight, shearing the water. They just kind of go right over the edge of the waves, pick up some lift from the air coming right off that wave. They hardly ever flap. Um, there is several different kinds we might see called great shearwaters, quarry shearwater, um, manx shearwater, and sooty shearwater. And then there are the northern gannets. Uh, many of you I'm sure will have seen them. They're big birds, bigger than gulls. They have a long bill, pointy tail, and they dive straight down into the water after their um, fish, which is their food. Now, these again, these are birds. If you want to see them for sure, you want to go on a whale watch or a boat that's going offshore because that's where you're most likely to find them. And this is the time of year when there's some migration going on and movement. So you have a good chance of seeing them. Things like the Wilson storm petrel, which is a very little small black bird uh, with white on its tail. And they, they, they flutter, flutter and dabble their feet in the water. They're up here in the summer because they breed in the southern hemisphere. So when it is summer for us, it is winter for them in the southern hemisphere. So they come up here and they're here in the summer and then they head back south um, to breed when it's our winter. So the time to see them is actually in our summertime and they'll be leaving relatively soon. The shearwaters are still around, you can see them. But what I was going to say is keep an eye out for storms that might be off our coast or coming right up our coast because sometimes that pushes these pelagic birds close to shore. Normally they don't want to be in 
on land or close to land, but when we've got really strong east winds and some stormy weather happening, you can um, go to the coast and watch out in the, the water and you have a chance of seeing these pelagic species. When we get into the winter time, we have a couple of other pelagics that arrive, um, the northern fulmar and the black-legged kittiwake. Kittiwakes look like gulls, like small delicate gulls, but again, they're pelagic. They're mostly always found way offshore. And northern fulmars are all, they're, they're a little gull-like um, in, in their sort of shape. But if you've ever been on a fishing boat offshore uh, in the wintertime uh, and people start catching um, fish and there's sort of throwbacks in the water, um, then you'll find that um, kittiwakes and fulmars will come in close to the boat looking for those small fish and looking to get some food. Uh, so it's a time to think about um, sort of a, a new kind of new group of birds that maybe you haven't seen before. And this is the time to think about them. Hi, Susan. Ah, Susan, the screech owl at Audubon. I will check on him. Um, I haven't been at Audubon for a little bit, so I'll check and find out what's going on with the screech owl. Um, I'm making a little note. I'll check with Shelby, um, our animal, animal care and uh, educator, and find out uh, what's going on with the, the screech owl. And thanks for watching from uh, from Penacook. All right, let me see if I've, I'm going to check my phone for any other comments. Okay, great. Um, one other thing to be watching for now that people are reporting is lots of red-breasted nuthatches. So the we have two different kinds of nuthatches you can see in New Hampshire. There's the white-breasted nuthatch and the red-breasted nuthatch. Uh, white-breasted nuthatch is just like it says, white, white breast, grayish back, black on the top of its head. And the red-breasted nuthatch has a sort of rusty colored breast, um, gray on the back, and sort of black and white racing, racing stripes, I call them, on its head. And it has a little higher pitch noise than the white-breasted. The red breast is kind of a and it tends to be a little wound up more like a little, little like it's got a little nervousness or it's it's really ready to go um so you can hear them up in the trees they're feeding on our our pine cone crop we've got a huge pine cone crop this fall and we've got loads of red breasted nut hatches around uh now red breasted nut hatches some will stay year round, but they do tend to be migratory. And usually about every other year, we get flights of red breasteds. And sometimes they'll come right through and go farther south. Other times they'll hang around. And this is one of those years where people are seeing them in big numbers. Um, any, any place where you've got some um, pine cones, listen for them, watch for them. They're little, they're small birds. Uh, and, but sometimes they're very curious. So oftentimes, um, if you do what birders do called pishing, which is making a, a noise, psh, 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 uh, they tend to get a little curious about that noise. It may be sort of partly an alarm call and they're coming to check and see what's going on. Uh, but you can try doing that and sometimes the little red-breasted nuthatches will come down and look at you. The male has a brighter red breast than the female. Uh, and then the youngsters in general. Um, so you can can look for them coming in and hopefully they'll stay around and we may uh, have them coming to our feeders this winter. That'd be great if we do. They're a lot of fun, fun to watch. Um, all right, let's see if I've got any any other comments. Just checking my phone. Uh, newest show up. Okay, I'm just checking comments. Some of them are coming through my phone and some are coming through the computer. Um, great, okay. All right, 
Uh, I think that's going to wrap it up for today. As I mentioned, if you have further questions, don't hesitate to email them to our volunteer naturalists. They're at birds, etc. at nhaudubon.org. That's B-I-R-D-S-E-T-C at nhaudubon.org. Go ahead and, um, and email us any comments, that, any questions that you'd like, or if you're on Facebook, you could uh, send a message and we'll definitely look at that uh, and uh, see if we can help you out with your questions. Um, New Hampshire Audubon, as a reminder, we are a um, nonprofit independent of National Audubon and we're dedicated to um, the protection of birds and wildlife in the state and the, the habitat of the birds and wildlife. So please, um, we really appreciate uh, any support that you can provide us. And Stefan, let me just check. You got one more comment. Uh, yeah, tons of red-breasted nuthatches in the Millbrook area. Mm -hmm, nothing conquered. And very curious. Yes, they can be extremely curious. Great to see. All right, if you're interested in supporting New Hampshire Audubon, you can do that on our website. We very much appreciate it. Again, I'm Becky Swamla with New Hampshire Audubon. Thanks for joining. We'll be back again. Bye-bye.